The following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with the University of Wisconsin. In a White House ceremony on March 9th, President Barack Obama signed an executive order ending an eight-year restriction on federal funding for embryonic stem cell research. Two experts from the University of Wisconsin-Madison were on hand to witness the event. We'll meet them and discuss the scientific and ethical implications of this presidential decision. Next, on Office Hours. Hi, I'm University of Wisconsin professor Ken Goldstein. Promise and controversy have revolved around stem cell research from the beginning. And this beginning took place here in Madison, Wisconsin, where researchers have been at the forefront of scientific and ethical developments in this field. Joining us today are two of those researchers, Professor Clive Svensson and Alta Sharo. Dr. Svensson is a professor of anatomy and neurology who studies the growth and differentiation of human stem cells. His latest research includes developing stem cell models for degenerative conditions like ALS and Huntington disease. Alta Sharo is a professor of law and bioethics with extensive experience in stem cell ethics policy. She served on President Clinton's National Bioethics Advisory Commission and helped draft the National Academy's guidelines for embryonic stem cell research in 2005. More recently, she was a member of the Obama-Biden transition team. Thanks very much to both of you for, uh, for joining us. Wow, I don't know where to start. Quite a week, quite a week. Uh, you end up here on, uh, on Thursday in, uh, in, in the studio at University of Wisconsin. Monday, you were in the White House. Let's start. We're going to get to talking about the science and the ethics of this. But, Clive, tell me, tell me a little bit about that event. Yeah, so I was <coughs> traveling actually in California when I got uh, an email actually from Malta saying that there'll be uh, an email from the White House soon. And sure enough, it came. And uh, we were hearing the announcement was coming Monday. Very, very exciting after eight years. <laughs> so, you know. Be at the White House on Monday, we have something to say. That was kind of it. So I kind of picked up things and said, I think I'm going to go home uh, via Washington. So. So I don't think I'm revealing any, any great, great secrets. Um, Alta may have known about this a little bit before the rest of us who saw it in the newspapers on, uh, on, on, on Friday. You were on the Obama-Biden transition team. Mm -hmm. You've been involved in doing stem cell policy and, and, and worked on this. Tell me a little bit about the process of you finding out about it and how the decision was made. Well, I think... Everybody knew that uh, President Obama had made promises while on the campaign trail. He had said that he would change the Bush policy, which had limited federal funding quite significantly in this really promising area of science. And the only question was the timing. And of course, I think everybody in the audience knows that since the election and since the inauguration, we've had a series of major events concerning the economy. So the timing was always a little uncertain. But in the background, Moving forward constantly was the finalization of the actual language of the executive order, the precise orders that would be given to NIH in developing this further and having guidelines for the actual expenditure of monies, and then finally the notion of how to structure an event, whether it's a White House event or it's at the NIH where it's poor science. What kinds of people do you want, including stem cell scientists like Dr. Svensson? Uh, Surprisingly, very little of that gets resolved until very close to the date when it actually occurs. <laughs> so, so not a six-week planning for this. Well, there may be six-week planning, but the six-week planning runs all the way right up to six hours before. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Now, because there had been some talk that President Obama would take the oath of office, do the parade, and before he went off to go dancing at the balls, would sign a series of executive orders, um, and this would be one of them. But they decided to no, not go that direction. That's right. If you think back to the first few days after inauguration, the very first executive orders that he signed had to do with things like the prison camps that we've been running outside the United States and the use of interrogation techniques that are widely regarded as forms of torture in the international community. So there were many, many items that had been lined up during the transition as worthy of presidential attention early on. And of course, you can't say that any one is most crucial, but I think he certainly chose some very defensible uh, policies, I mean, s some very defensible choices about policies to revoke immediately. Let, let me ask this to Alta first and then get, get both of you. So, big event at the White House, tremendous press coverage, obviously tremendous excitement for folks in the stem cell community who wanted this, who wanted this uh, executive order signed. What exactly did that executive order say? 
And then I want to ask you, how exactly that, is that going to change your life once everyone in the press stops asking you questions? But, but first to Alta, what exactly does that executive order say? It starts with a preamble that explains that there really is an obligation on the part of government to try and help citizens who are sick or injured. And for that reason, we really need to use our power to promote research in a responsible fashion. So it tells the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the incoming director of the National Institutes of Health, NIH, to go back, look at the state of stem cell science across all fields of stem cell science. And it very explicitly references not only embryonic but non-embryonic forms of stem cell science. Look at the entire field, figure out what are the areas that need to be funded because they have real promise scientifically or promise for developing cures for patients. And then look at all of the guidelines and regulations that have been developed in other countries and along in individual states uh, over the last eight years to govern this research, to figure out how it can be done responsibly with due regard for all the individuals involved where the science really needs to be done and to come back with recommendations. It involves a public policy process with consultation. And then it concludes by saying we now will essentially revoke the policies that have been put in place by the Bush administration in order to give the NIH the ability to go forward and do this consultation and come back with a new policy for us. Okay. Quickly, Clive, you've got about 30, 45 seconds mm -hmm. left in this segment. How does this change your life in the immediate short term in terms of the research you're doing? Or is this something that's not going to be clear how it changes your research for a little bit of time? Well, for me, the excitement was, was bigger than just stem cells. And I think he purposely put up a number of Nobel laureates behind who had nothing to do with stem cell research, but are very well respected in the field. And I think this is Obama's way of saying science is good. Uh, science is where America is going to go in the future if, if we're going to be a leading country. Uh, and stem cell biology, if it's done in the right way, is also good. And I was uh, very excited because young people have had the impression, uh, coming to my lab, <coughs> there was something wrong with stem cells because President Bush wouldn't allow it. And of course, that's not true. It's a very complicated situation. Uh, and of course, it has to be done in an ethically uh, sound way. And I think President Obama made that point. Um, but providing you do that, uh, it's, it's a fantastic field of research. And when I got back to the lab, the nice thing is uh, uh, we've been fighting to separate out uh, the so-called presidential lines that President Bush said we could use uh, from the new lines that we can't use, which is not an arbitrary decision that was made. Uh, we can now merge all that research together. And, and all the labs, I think, across the states are going to be breathing a sigh of relief. Yeah. You don't have to waste time, money, and effort to separate uh, an artificial line in the sand that President Bush drew between one stem cell line and another stem cell line, which never really made any sense uh, apart from uh, in, inside uh, Bush's administration. Excellent. When we come back, we're going to discuss much more of the science behind stem cells, and we're going to take a look at some of the cutting-edge research going on here at the University of Wisconsin. Please stay with us. This program is a production of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you have comments about this broadcast, please email them to programming at uc.wisc.edu. The University of Wisconsin has been inspired by the Wisconsin idea. Which says the good work of the university extends to the boundaries of the state and beyond. So the UW works hard to help build Wisconsin's economy. Educate people of all ages. Advance health and medicine. And enhance the quality of life for all of us. Hit it! The University of Wisconsin-Madison. Forward thinking. We're back with Professors Clive Svensson and Alta Shara. Okay, Clive. Stem cells, stem cells, stem cells, huge media coverage. Barack Obama signs the executive order. Bush didn't allow it. Obama allows it. What is stem cell research? Well, it's a very wide field. Uh, the one that most people are familiar with is the idea of a cell therapy. Uh, and embryonic stem cells can be pushed into any type of cell in the body, bone, brain, heart, blood. And the potential for these new therapies is instead of going to the doctor and getting a pill, you get a cell. And you get a cell if you have a heart attack and you have weak heart muscle, and perhaps have a cell to replace neurons in the brain. And of course, in diabetes, replacing those islet cells that die. And this is a new concept in, in medicine. Now, the other idea that isn't so talked about is modeling uh, serious human diseases. 
if we have a human stem cell that can make any tissue in the body, uh, we can now take those stem cells from patients who have serious diseases and model the disease in the dish. It's quite phenomenal. And this is going to allow drug companies to screen new drugs very rapidly on human cells, and I think will lead to incredible breakthroughs. On that last point, I've heard you describe it. When the police see a car accident, they come, the car's already hit the tree, they don't know what happened. Yep. This enables you, actually, in a sense, to push back time and watch the progression of a disease happen in the cell. Yep, and that's exactly what we hope to be able to do. We can replay the disease process. Normally, you get people with a disease who've, who've already suffered the disease, and you see the end stage. What we'd like to know is, how did it start? What was the trigger for that disease? So we can take the stem cell, rewind it back to the beginning of the disease process, and then move it forward through the disease, watch the cells die during the disease, and then intervene with drugs and see which drugs stop those cells from dying. And we can replay that over and over again in the dish. So your research has found that, 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 that looked into that yep. was not using embryonic stem cells, correct? There's different sorts of stem cells that one may, may look to for research and possible therapy. So talk to me a little bit about the distinction between embryonic stem cells and the other sorts that you used in that particular piece of research. In that piece of research, we actually took uh, what are called adult skin cells and made them into something that looks like an embryonic stem cell. And it's this new technique, actually, Jamie Thompson, again here in Wisconsin, and Shinya Yamanaka in Japan, uh, published this last year. And essentially, you put a number of uh, genes into an adult skin cell and reprogram it back to an embryonic state. And we call these IPS cells. And we did that with a patient who had spinal muscular atrophy, a neurological illness. We got embryonic-like stem cells out, and then we pushed them through the disease process and saw that the neurons died in the dish, just like they did in the child that had this disease. Phenomenal new idea. Um, these cells are called pluripotent stem cells that are derived from the adult cells. They're very similar to embryonic stem cells, but we don't yet know if they're the same. So we need to keep working with embryonic stem cells for the foreseeable future until we work out, are these exactly the same uh, or are they a little different? And in clinical terms and using these cells in patients, we have to engineer them and put these genes in, which is dangerous. So we wouldn't want to put those cells into patients. A number of reasons why we should continue using embryonic stem cells, and which is why President Obama's uh, 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 signing of, of that uh, uh, executive, executive order, order uh, was so important. Let me turn to, to Alta here for a second. So embryonic stem cells come from an embryo. Mm -hmm. An egg is fertilized, sperm, egg, frozen. It's something that's not going to be used, in, implanted in, a, in, 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 in someone's treatment. Um, and people have ethical issues about that who believe that's a life. Mm -hmm. Clive's telling me, well, they can essentially go back in time on adult stem cells and move it back to that. Wouldn't that seem to solve the problem? And folks on the pro-life side would say, hey, you don't need to do this embryonic stuff. Well, I, I will answer that. But before I do, I really need to be sure that everybody understands that the president's change on uh, March 9th was not a change that involved having public money used to actually destroy any embryos. We are talking about having public money used to work on cell lines that have been created by people who are working with private money, with money from foreign governments, some state governments, and they're working to, they're working with embryos that uh, by and large were about to be discarded by couples at infertility clinics who had extra embryos left over. But it, the, the federal money we're talking about is working on cell lines, not working on embryos. But nonetheless, there are many people, yes, who say, given these new developments, uh, why is it that we need to fund anything that even walks close to embryo destruction, even if it's not actually financing it? And this is a debate around how we balance a variety of values. There's an awful lot of importance many people place upon embryonic forms of life. Many would like to see them protected and brought to viability if at all possible. Others simply see them as emotionally fraught and not to be used indiscriminately or frivolously. And yet at the same time, we have hundreds of thousands of people with spinal cord injuries, with Huntington's career, with Lou Gehrig's disease, with Parkinson's disease, with diabetes, who may possibly be helped if we can work across all avenues of research and find out as quickly as possible which kinds of stem cells are best for which applications, some for drug discovery, some for treatment. And it, it's this balance between the needs of those who are sick and injured and our emotional uh, regard for embryos that is so difficult. I'm going to jump in there. 
When we come back on Office Hours, we're going to continue our conversation, continue to talk about some of the ethical concerns, and also talk about some of the therapeutic potential of stem cell research. Please stay with us. Consider this. There's a public university that consistently ranks among the top in the number of Peace Corps volunteers and in the number of graduates serving as CEOs of Fortune 500 companies whether they are leading corporations or changing the world. The next time you see people doing extraordinary things, they are probably badgers. The University of Wisconsin-Madison. Forward thinking. Welcome back to Office Hours. We're talking about stem cells tonight with Clive Svensson and Alta Sharo. To University of Wisconsin research who, researchers who have been intimately involved in research and ethical issues about stem cells. Clive, so just in that last segment, we were again talking about the difference between embryonic, research using embryonic stem cells and research using adult stem cells. And Alta was talking about the balance that one, that one looks at. Some people think embryos are life and we're destroying life. Some people think it's not yet life or they'd be destroyed anyways and we should use it for, for positive medical research. If you're though able to find, if you're able to research adult stem cells, why do we even have to bother to have this debate? Well, this is like um, all areas of research uh, shouldn't be dictated by the ethics. They should be dictated by the science. Um, there's a sort of misnomer that adult cells already over the last 15 years have cured you know, 70 diseases. Uh, that is a misnomer, that uh, adult cell, stem cells can modulate disease progression in some cases. There's very few uh, breakthrough therapies. The, the, um, one exception to that is blood disorders, I think, where, where you can do adult transplants. Um, the power of embryonic so stem cells... So scientifically they're not equivalent? No. The power of embryonic stem cells is they can make all tissues of the body, and that is just a fact. Um, and I think we're in the very interesting area of science, and science generally moves much faster than the ethics and, and the policy. And the science is, is zooming ahead. And the distinctions between adult stem cells um, and embryonic stem cells are actually merging a little bit in the scientific field as we move forward. But the importance of taking embryonic stem cells, as it has been important for the last 10 years, will, be continue, uh, will continue to be important for the next 10 years because they're bona fide. They're the ones that have been tested. Those are the cells that we know. And my analogy is uh, with adult stem cells that are reprogrammed and embryonic stem cells. It's a little like going to the car show. Uh, when you see a concept car. Now, you wouldn't drive that concept car home. The wheels would drop off. It needs 10 years of research. That is the adult stem cell that's reprogrammed. Uh, you would drive home the, uh, I've got to be careful what car I choose here, the Toyota <laughs> or the GM car, uh, because you know it's had years and years of testing and that's the one that is reliable and that's the one that's going to give you a result. Those are the embryonic stem cells. Uh, we need to keep working on them. And that's why this executive order was so important. Well, let's, let's go back to this executive order. It seems to me, just as a lay observer of it, that there's been some misconceptions on both sides. The event happens at the White House. The world immediately doesn't change. Every single element of the scientific policy, of the ethical policy of stem cells, doesn't change. No. President Barack Obama directed the NIH to go look at this, to report back to him what exactly is going to happen now and what's not going to change. There's still significant congressional restrictions as well. Right. So, first, by revoking the um, policy set forth by President George W. Bush, the one thing that has changed immediately is that laboratories no longer need to separate their federal and non-federally funded stem cell research as carefully as before. It means they no longer need to buy two refrigerators, two shakers, two electrical cords. So we've already saved you're, a great sorry, deal wait, of money. You, you were telling me there was actually there'd be stickers on the federal microscope and the non-federal microscope. Absolutely. And you'd have to buy two microscopes instead of using one, right? So immediately we've got some uh, improvements in the laboratory environment and there are other places where they can finally enter the field without having to build separate facilities. But, and the second thing that will not change is that the National Institutes of Health will continue to fund research on non-embryonic forms of stem cell, uh, stem cell research, such as adult stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, stem cells from fetal sources, which they've been funding all along and will continue to fund so long as there's some good scientific reason to do so. However, the executive order does now direct the National Institutes of Health to develop a set of guidelines for which kinds of embryonic stem cell lines it will allow its funded researchers to use. That means it's got to decide 
when, if ever, those lines, in fact, are needed for a scientifically worthy experiment, and which, all, some, only a few, which of those lines were made in a way that is responsible and ethically defensible. And for that, they're going to be looking at all of the guidelines and regulations that have been written in England, in California, the voluntary guidelines we did for the National Academy of Sciences, to get inspiration, present a draft to the public for comment. They will receive thousands, tens of thousands of comments, which they will have to, re have to respond to before they issue the final guidelines that will then govern how they release their money. Regardless of all of that, the one thing that will not happen there will be no federal money used to actually work with an embryo itself. That is something that is forbidden by a congressional enactment called the Dickey Wicker Amendment. That is not going to change as a result of the president's actions. I'm going to jump in here. We'll come back in our next segment. We'll talk about the Dickey Wicker Amendment and then look into the proverbial crystal ball and see what might be down the road in the field of stem cell research. Stay with us on Office Hours. This program is a production of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you have comments about this broadcast, please email them to programming at uc.wisc.edu. Welcome back to Office Hours. In our last quick segment here, I want Clive to really take a look in the crystal ball and tell me what he thinks are going to be the big medical findings coming out of stem cell research down the line, the next year, the next two years, the next 10 years? Well, as Alto was just mentioning in the break, um, Geron Corporation in California have just had the first uh, FDA-approved trial using embryonic stem cells, human embryonic stem cells, in this case pushed to a neural fate and transplanted into patients with spinal cord injury. Uh, now the hope there is uh, that the patients will get better, uh, would do better than they would have. And I think the, the concern is that people will expect a lot too much from the very first grafts that are put into patients. And the excitement is going to be we actually have moved to a clinical trial with embryonic stem cells. And I think we have to be careful not to expect too much in the first few years. And we should be very happy with small improvements in the patients or even just safety that the cells went in and survived. And then there'll be a growing number of trials coming out uh, in different diseases. I think you'll see trials in heart disease fairly quickly, uh, followed by diabetes. And I think these are going to be the very first trials, small ones, headline grabbing trials that you'll see in the newspapers. And generally, very slowly then, you'll make progress into larger scale trials with lots of patients. And quietly in the background, uh, which won't get into the media as much, is the disease modeling that we talked mm -hmm. about. And I think for my money, and Jamie Thompson I think thinks this as well, uh, that's where the real fruits are going to be. Because uh, we'll understand what happens with disease uh, using that technique, what causes human disease. Excellent. Alta, Clive, thanks so much for joining us today. That's all the time we have this week. Special thanks to both of you. Thanks to you for joining us on Office Hours. Please join us next time. The preceding program was produced by the University of Wisconsin in association with the Big Ten Network.